Uh, The sermon this morning is entitled Adventure, Trial, and Joy. The name changed like four times, and it probably will change before the end of the sermon, but that's what it is at the moment. And this sermon is a sermon I would have liked to have heard when I was graduating high school and making that decision of what college to go to. Okay, actually, that decision was made for me, Um, but what college to go to, what career to go into, what major to do. And I hope that this sermon kind of frees you a little bit. It it lets you take your own path. It lets you uh, not feel like you have to be in a hurry. And I hope it does that for other people too. Because of wherever you are in this, in this life, whether it's young or old, I think that you can benefit from the sermon. And I think that if we as a church can change our mindset like what this sermon is going to talk about, then I believe it can have awesome implications for the work that we can do here at North Broad. Whenever you were growing up, you were maybe not taught, but one of two stories was suggested to you. Uh, one of two stories you sort of picked up on as you were growing up. It may, it may have never been said explicitly. In fact, one thing may have been said, and they, you may have ended up uh, sort of picking up on a different story. And you would have picked up on this in your house. You would have picked up on this in your uh, school, in your Sunday school, in sermons that you listen to. And even some of the songs that we sing uh, convey one or two of these different messages. Even when you read scripture, different people had sort of different outlooks on life. You look at Jonah. Uh, he had one of these, as you're going to see, and then someone like Paul had, the completely different, had a completely different perspective. And I hope that I can encourage you to, to sort of change your mind uh, if you sort of fall into this one category, the category that I fell into. So which one of these did you pick up on whenever you were growing up? Is life an adventure that you get to go on? Was that the story? Or... Is life a trial to be endured? Which one of those was sort of the predominant story as you were growing up? Is life an adventure you get to go on, or is life a trial to be endured? This latter one was my story growing up for sure. And we're going to talk about uh, some different characteristics of what that sort of looks like. So for example, uh, this first story uh, is, is rather the second story, is life a trial to be endured? Uh, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. You ever heard of one of those, self-fulfilling prophecy? That is, whenever you think this way, you're going to start to see that, uh, that, this, that, that this is true to you, right? It might not be objectively true, but it's true to you. It's what you experience in this life. It's something that you bring about on yourself when you live life thinking that life is a trial to be endured. One of the words used in this, in this kind of story is the word woe. W-O-E, that is woe to me, right? Like, oh, I'm just, so, I'm just so sad, I'm just so broken down, I'm just so uh, downhearted. Everything's terrible, everything is going wrong. You've heard, you've heard this law before, uh, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Yeah, that's, that comes in this, in this second story, in this second way of viewing life, that life is a trial to be endured. It's almost as if, it's almost as if bad things are expected to happen. Right? And, and almost like those are the defining moments of your life is the, bad, is the bad parts. In fact, everything negative that happens to you when this story is your story simply confirms what you've been told your whole life. Simply confirms what you've picked up on in your whole life. Like, for example, if your phone dies, you know, like you're out away from the house, your phone dies, and you're like, oh my goodness, like my phone died, really? Like I charged it, I know I charged it, why is it that? And like it just ruins your whole day. You know, because from your perspective, life is a trial to be endured. And so when that's your viewpoint, every little thing that happens, even if it's just a little thing, can just ruin the rest of the week, can ruin the rest of the month. Uh, Like, for example, last week we had some technology stuff that was messing up. One perspective, my like initial reaction to that is, oh man, the whole thing's ruined. No, it's not. Am I really going to let something like that just ruin my whole day, right? Throw off my whole week? A bad grade on a test, that teacher that, that kind of gets on your nerves, uh, that boss that's a little bit overbearing, am I really going to let that be like the defining thing of my life? Like that's how I have to live every day? No, not going to happen. You might have heard this phrase before, all good things, what, come to an end? Are you serious? Really? What about eternal life? <laughs> Does that come to an end? What about God? Does he come to an end? 
1 Corinthians 13 says that love never fails. Is love going to come to an end? Is that really a story that you want to buy into? All good things must come to an end. What about marriage? Some marriages come to an end, don't they? It's tragic, isn't it? But is that the design? Is that the idea behind it? That, oh yeah, you know, all good things come to an end. No. Why, why would you want to believe? Why would you want to believe that? Like, imagine thinking that. You know what that does? That robs the joy of life. That makes it so that any good thing that you get, maybe it's a new job, maybe it's moving to a new place, maybe it's entering into another relationship. I'll talk about that in a second. Or maybe it's even getting a gift. Or the person who treats you bad treats you good one day. You can't even trust that, right? Your question about the job is, okay, when's this whole thing going to blow up, right? When, when am I going to meet that person that's going to make this whole thing not worth it? You can never trust that it's just a gift, that you never trust that it can just be good. Like what God said in Genesis chapter 1. He looked at the, whole, at the whole thing and he said, this is good. But whenever you have this idea that life is a trial to be endured, you have this idea that all good things must come to an end, you can't even trust the good things whenever they come. And so when they do, you don't even have the, the, the opportunity to fully enjoy them, Right? you ever thought about that? This idea of uh, life as a trial to be endured also has with it this thing, this thing called scarcity. That is, there's not enough joy to go around, right? There's not enough money to go around. There's not enough uh, food to go around. And so I better really lock myself in and hold on to what I got. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to have anything for tomorrow. And yet what Jesus said was in Matthew chapter 6, take no thought of tomorrow. Don't worry about this kind of stuff. Don't worry about what clothes you're going to wear, what food that you're going to eat. And he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Do we really believe that? If we did, we wouldn't be so worried about what tomorrow holds. We wouldn't have to buy into this whole thing about scarcity, as if there's not enough to go around. There's plenty enough to go around. God created this world for us all to be able to live and to have joy and to prosper and to enjoy each other's company. This, this thing about life as a trial to be endured scares us into being super protective of what we've got, not being willing to extend a helping hand out of fear that we might lose out on the next day, right? There's also this thing called elevator salvation. Anybody ever hear of elevator salvation? So elevator salvation is this. The only purpose of the gospel is to get your rear end into heaven. <laughs> that's, that's it. When you live like this, you, li you live looking up like an elevator, right? That's all you do. And, and so this life, you kind of like, okay, this world, you know, oh, well, this thing is going to be, you know, it's going to be destroyed one day anyway, so why even worry about it? Why even try? You know, all I got to do is just get myself to heaven, and then everything will be okay. But you know what happens whenever you have this mindset is you're looking up, and you're, you're, uh, you can't even notice the suffering that's going around beneath you, right? When you're looking up, you can't even see where you're going. And <laughs> right? It makes you fall. It makes you, uh, it makes you not be able to care for those around you. It makes you not be able to love your neighbor. Because if you're constantly looking up, only concerned about your little world, what Jesus has done for you specifically, then you lose out on the fact that you can be a blessing to every single person around you. If the gospel isn't good news for everybody that you come into contact in your life, you're not doing it right. It's not good news for anybody. The gospel transforms you so that you can transform those around you. This idea that life is a trial to be endured makes us lose out on this opportunity that we have to be co-creators of God in this life, not only to be little new creations ourselves, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, but to participate with God in the renewal and the reconciliation of all things, every person around us, every negative situation. Own that and, and bring it to the glory of God. Then we have this other way of thinking, which is that life is an adventure that you get to go on. You've probably heard this before. Uh, you don't have to go to church, you get to go to church, right? But is that really the message that, is that really the message that we've bought into? Do we really believe that you get to and that you don't have to? I don't know. I don't know. Oh yeah, by the way, on this other part, let me put this into, into, uh, into Church of Christ lingo. Have you ever been so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good? There we go. Now it's translated. I need a translator here to spit things out in ways that, <laughs> that we're used to hearing. This other idea, though, is self-fulfilling as well. If you believe that life is an adventure that you get to go on, then you're not going to be defined by those negative moments, by times of loss, by times of discomfort, by times of pain. 
You're going to be looking for, uh, for the woe, not the W-O-E, but the W-O-A-H. Whoa, I get to live on this world that God created? Whoa, I get to have the job that I do? Whoa, I get to have the family that I, that I have, warts and all? I get to go to the church that I, that I go to? I get to sit in this class at this time, go to this school, work at this job? Like, this is all a blessing. The whole thing is a gift. And, and you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, but Daniel, bad things, bad things do happen. Yeah, that's not, that's not news to anybody. This perspective just looks at it a little bit differently. This perspective says, okay, here comes this annoying person that I always have to deal with. What lesson are they trying to teach me today? What gift do they have for me? Okay, yeah, I've got to work this job. And it's just a temporary thing that's going to get me to the next, next stage of my life. But it's not just, just like a tangent. It's something that can give you real gift and opportunity for growth. It looks at everything as a lesson, even the most devastating loss. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 says, Though Jesus were a son, yet he learned obedience through the things which he suffered. That's a powerful passage. Even the, even the cross, the suffering, the pain, the rejection, that not only started in the last week of his life, but went back to the beginning of his ministry. He looked at all of that as a lesson, as an opportunity to, as an opportunity to learn, as Hebrews 5, 8 says. And we can look at the negative things in our lives as lessons to grow as well. Uh, Peter talks about, in 1 Peter chapter 1, how their faith was being tried so that they would become more precious than fine gold and fine silver. Growing up, I used to read uh, Matthew chapter 3 in this way, that uh, John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoelaces, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Here's how I read it. The Holy Spirit or fire. Like there's a choice. Some of you get the Spirit, some of you get the fire. No, we all go through trials, don't we? It's that God uses the Holy Spirit through those trials to, to bring us further uh, to maturity, to bring us closer to maturity, to bring us closer to perfection. The Holy Spirit and the trials work together. The trying of your faith works patience. When you look at life as an adventure that we get to go on, we get to be here, everything's a blessing, then even the negative things, even the most painful loss can be an opportunity for your family to go closer together. Even the time that you lose your job, even the teacher that gets on your nerves in college, even the the friends that have have, uh, not treated you like friends should, even they can be lessons for you. Even they can be turned into something positive. Because in this way of thinking, Good isn't just hoped for, good is expected. Remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 8, that all things work together for good for for those that love him. All things. He says in another passage, just a little bit further down, that we're more than conquerors. There's nothing, no height, no depth, nor any creature, no, no life, death, things present, things to come, no principality, no power, nothing that can separate us from God. In fact, he says, all things are yours. So own it, own the pain, own the suffering, and figure out a way that you can grow from that. Not as a confirmation that life is simply a trial to be endured, but as an opportunity to strengthen your faith, to go closer to your friends, and even to help the church out here at North Broad. Paul, uh, writing to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice evermore. He said in Philippians 4, 6, rejoice in the Lord always. There's no exceptions there. That doesn't mean rejoice in the Lord in the good times. It means going through the bad times as well. There's always an opportunity for joy. You know why? Because there's plenty. We have all spiritual blessings, Paul says, all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. There's nothing that doesn't belong to you. Eternal life, grace, hope, faith, everything is yours. It's kind of like the, the, the father told the older son in the story of the, in the, story of the uh, prodigal son. He said, everything that I have is yours. If we believe that, then even the negative things that happen to us in this life become nothing. Why would I let that ruin my life? Why would I let that define me? The, uh, we talked a moment ago about uh, relationships. Have you ever met somebody who went through a terrible, awful relationship? Physically abusive, mentally abusive. Maybe there was some, um, maybe someone cheated on someone else. And then when they finally find someone who's good for them, who loves them with all their heart, who wants nothing but the best for them, what do they have such a hard time doing? 
They can't accept it, can they? They can't accept it. They've become conditioned to expect something. And that's how these two questions are. Is life a trial to be endured, or is life an adventure that we get to go on? These questions and how we answer them condition us to accept both the good things and the negative things in our life in certain ways, right? But there's plenty of blessings to go around. And so why, we sh- why shouldn't we try to enjoy everything that God has in store for us, both the good and the bad? This is a joy, as we're going to notice momentarily, that refuses, that refuses to accept death as the final answer. It, it doesn't matter how bad things get. No, that's not the end. Because what we learn from Jesus is that after the cross, three days after the cross, there's always resurrection. Right? There's always spring after the winter. Happens every year. Spring always comes. There's always sunshine after the storm. We never accept death as the final answer. It's kind of like, like on who wants to be a millionaire. Uh, do you? Uh, death, is that your final answer? No, it's not. I'm going to phone a friend, and his name's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, okay. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. So Paul goes through this whole list of people in chapter 11. It could be Paul, it could be Ananias, uh, it could be Priscilla, who knows. He goes through this whole list of people in Hebrews, and he uh, talks about their faith. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, he paints the picture of a uh, of arena. And he says that we're, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So let's throw aside the thing that, uh, that, that, it, that uh, bears us down. Let's throw aside the sin that always gets in our way. And let's run with patience, right? But then he says this in verse 2, that Christ Jesus, he's the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now let's break this passage down. Who for the joy set before him. In other words, Jesus was not going to let the shame and the suffering and the rejection and the darkness that happened when he died, he wasn't going to let that define him. He approached the cross with joy. Was there a little bit of reluctancy? Not my will, but thine be yours. You know, let this cup pass from me. Was, there, was he a little, a little timid at first? Yeah, that was there. That happens when you're facing a big challenge, whether it's college or a new job or something. But none of that could stop him because it was the joy. He had to do it. There was no choice but to go to the cross simply because of the joy of it, the opportunity to share God's love with the world, the opportunity to share this gift of, the, of eternal life with us. And here we are 2,000 years later because of the joy. So you're going to go into a negative situation. You know you're going to face it. A tough class, a tough relationship. You have someone that you're dealing with. Something's going on in the family. There's a bunch of things that have not been said that need to be said. And the longer that they go unsaid, the longer the tension builds up and the the more trouble you get yourself into, right? What Jesus would say is, go into that thing with the joy set before you just to give that gift. He said he endured the cross, endured the cross, because he knew what was coming three days later. He knew that resurrection was on the other side, and resurrection is on the other side for us as well. Death is not the final answer. He despised the shame. Thought about that. that What does that mean? To look down on the shame, to despise it? That's not going to define him. And our negative things that happen in our life, whether it be a relationship that goes bad, a job that goes bad, a a, a, uh, an opportunity that goes not like we wanted it to, that doesn't define us. People might try to define us by those moments. No, that's not us anymore. We've been redeemed. We've been made new. We're a new creation. That's what defines us, how God looks at us. Don't let other people put these labels on you. Despise the shame. And then he sat down beside God. How about that? See, that's what's waiting for us. Whenever we enter into these negative situations, whatever it might be, with with the joy set before us, knowing that God can use even that thing to to, to bring us even closer to him, the pain of it isn't that big of a deal anymore. The shame of it isn't that big of a deal anymore. That's not what has to define us. And that's adventure, trial, and joy. You're going into the next stage of your life, my seniors. But for everybody else, the next chapter of your life starts here in just a few moments when we say amen. 
What are you going to let define you? The trials, the shame, the pain, the breakups, the lost jobs, the lost money, the debt? Is that, is that what's going to define you? Or are you going to let God define you? A new creature, washed, redeemed, sanctified, holy, beloved, loved, and loving. What are you going to allow to define you? Look at trials, not as confirmation that this world is just a terrible place, but as an opportunity to grow and to learn and to know that even God can enter into that situation and redeem it. Because how, how you choose to answer those questions will transform how you view everything going on from here forward. It can transform everything that we, as a church, how we view everything even as a church, as a body of believers. Sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes we have struggles. Is that going to be how we talk about church? <laughs> is that going to be the things that define us? those temporary setbacks, or is the love of Christ that's constantly propelling us forward into the ever-expanding kingdom of God going to define us? What are we going to allow to have that voice uh, in our head? The negativity or the positivity that learns to grow even in the midst of negativity, right? What is it that defines us? That's what we have to ask ourselves today, because if we don't, we might go through life of all men most miserable, (laughs) Let's, uh, let's say a prayer together. God, we just thank you so much for your loving kindness. We thank you so much for, for the peace that passes understanding. Father, we pray that each day that we face a, a different trial, that you'll just give us a taste of that peace so we won't let those things define us. Instead, we'll be defined by your blessings, by your love, by your mercy, by your grace, we, that, we, that we'll be defined by the positivity in the, positivity in the world and not the negativity. Father, we pray that you'll help us uh, change our story from from woe is me to loved is me, from all things that are good coming to an end to things that are truly good never come to an end. May you, learn, may you teach us to learn lessons in every situation, good or bad, from every person, positive or negative. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.